We are here in Orlando, Florida still. Yes, this is becoming a pattern at the National Conservatism Conference. And I am joined now by writer Derek Green. Derek, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. So your speech today, I mm -hmm. didn't catch all of it, mm -hmm. to be perfectly fair. I do know the topic. Okay. Um, really fascinating discussion. And I want you, I, I want you to just give us the overview of what you talked about because this is a conversation that's supposed to be off limits. This is a conversation that people are worried about having. Mm -hmm. And it's a conversation that you're willing to have. So let's do it. Absolutely. So what, what I started the, the, the remarks about the race and the nation. And my argument was that Blacks have tried to recreate ourselves in our own racial image for five or six generations. What we haven't tried to do is recreate ourselves with our national identity. We haven't been able to live into the national identity to feel comfortable uh, as America, with America being our home and as Americans. And so I made the pitch that maybe Blacks should stop trying to recreate ourselves racially. Let's redefine ourselves nationally. And so a lot of people came up to me and said, thank you for saying that because it's very difficult for me to talk about race. And it, it's very difficult for a lot of people to talk about race, particularly on the right, because we've ceded the language of race to the left. Uh, and the PR from the left towards conservatives and Republicans has always been their racist. So we spend so much try time trying to defend ourselves against charges of racism, rather than having a constructive conversation about how we can have a national inclusivity conversation that includes American Blacks, American Hispanics, uh, American Asians, so on and so forth. Right, it's like identity politics, but before you get to politics, almost yes. like identity culture, if you will. Yes, um, yes. And maybe not even culture, identity just as it pertains to race. And you're you're correct about the PR from the left. I mean, it's so vitriolic. Mm -hmm. It's actually, I, I always say it's a good commentary on our country and the mm -hmm. heart of our country, uh -huh. that the worst accusation you can face is um, that you're racist. Because everyone in this country <laughs> knows that that's the worst thing that you can be, sure. is to look disfavorably on someone based on the way that they look, based on immutable characteristics, the 100%. color of their skin. And yes. it is well known on both sides of the aisle that that's the worst accusation, the worst thing that you can be. Mm -hmm. The left has now frightened conservatives into even talking about this based on this threat of being accused of being a racist. Yep. But when when did this, this start or where did this um, come from? Because in order to fix a problem, you have to identify its root and how it, how it um, grew. Sure. What started this error in identity? I think it started with the Black Power Movement. Now, the central identity or the central facet of the Civil Rights Movement was that they were going to denuder race, right? Mm -hmm. Race wasn't going Color to be blonde. used. Yes, it, they, they had race neutrality. Race wasn't going to be used to, to affect racial dehumanization. So I think that was a good thing. The Black Power Movement came after the Civil Rights Movement in which they said, no, we don't like race neutrality. We don't like integration. Uh, we want to be defined as we see ourselves, and that's black. And they ch uh, specifically chose the word black because whites had denigrated it. So it started around 1968, 1969, and you have this progression of generations in which we, you know, during the civil rights movement, we were self-identified as Negroes. And then we went from Negro to Afro-American, or black, and then we went to Afro-American. And then we went to African-American with a hyphen. Now we're African-American with no hyphen. Now we're uh, ADOS, uh, African descendant of slaves or people of color. So every generation, we've sought to kind of define ourselves, and that's where it started, and we just haven't said enough. Our dignity comes because we're created in the image of God and renewed in the image of Christ. Our dignity does not come from our race. To be seen as equals, we should start to identify as Americans. And the reason I say that is because there's a, particularly from the left, they don't think that blacks can achieve the same as our counterparts. So they lower the standards and expectations when it comes to blacks. When you start paying attention to that, what they've actually done is removed all standards and expectations from blacks. So before we had the soft bigotry of low expectations, but when you remove standards and expectations, you have the hard bigotry of no expectations. So now we, and we allow it. So as we allow it and whites validate it. So now we're communicating to people that we're not equal, we're separate and unequal. I'm making the case that American Blacks are equal to their counterparts, and that's what we should do. And th this, uh, this actually, I think you're exactly correct, by the way. Mm -hmm. But this, this reminds me of the video that went viral when Chris Rufo was on Mark Lamont Hill's show, and mm -hmm. Mark Lamont Hill was trying to trap him into essentially saying that the white race was superior to the black race by saying, well, what do you like about being white mm -hmm. as a way of not just, not just you know, expressing pride in who God made you to be, but mm -hmm. in, in saying that, 
that pride in who God made you to be made you superior to someone else. Yeah. And I responded, I mean, Chris handled this just fine, perfectly mm-hmm. fine. Right. But I responded and said, listen, we should all be proud of what race we are because we are made in God's image. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I should be proud of being white because that's how God made me to be. And you should be proud of being black because that's how God made you to, to be. And not right. one is superior, not one is inferior. Right. And how, how do we take back this messaging? <laughs> how do we you know, look at this up and coming generation of mm-hmm. particularly in this case, young black Americans and, you know, prevent the indoctrination by the radical left who would use racialism to divide our country mm-hmm. and teach them to be proud to be American, that their primary identity is as a child of God, mm-hmm. of course, mm-hmm. and then as an American mm-hmm. and um, that the racialism is nonsense. It's going to be difficult because this is a multi-generational process. A lot of kids have come through government-sponsored schools and have been taught this you know, over and over and over. What you do when you teach children at a very young age that no matter what they do, white supremacy or white oppression or white privilege is going to get them, it robs them of hope and optimism. It fills them with a sense of hopelessness and nihilism. So then you go to any urban area in America and you say, look at all this chaos and dysfunction. Well, you've robbed them from optimism from a very young age and you've reinstilled in them that no matter what they do, they're going to be a victim. So it's got to start with the families. But the difficult thing is, is that a lot of those families are broken. So we have to reconstitute the family of the way that God ordained it at the very beginning to get men back into these families so they can be a model of masculinity for their son and the prototype of a man to marry for their daughters. That's where it starts. And then they can communicate what constructive masculinity looks like, why race is a blessing from God, but it's not a primary importance. I define myself as a writer, a theologian, a husband, a soon-to-be father. I know that I'm black. Thank you. I know that I'm black, but it doesn't define me on the top six or seven things. It isn't to say that I'm embarrassed of my race or anything like that. There's just more tangible things that define who I am and are much more interesting than race. And so we have to teach that to the younger children, particularly American black children, so they can say, one, we're not a victim. Two, we're Americans. Race may be important to you, but it's not as important to me. Right. And it it doesn't define you by any standards set by somebody else. A hundred percent. That's the problem. It's not, it's not a, um, it's not pride in race that's a problem. It's when that's defined by somebody else, Mm -hmm. um, that it can become really a way to control an individual. And when you start to use race as a, as, a, as a process to uplift your dignity, that's a superficial characteristic. That's why I said the intrinsic dignity is being created in the image of God and renewed in the image of Christ because that's much more tangible. Race comes, this day, blacks are, are, are in vogue. In 10 years, they may not be. If your self-esteem rests on that, you're gonna have you're gonna feel bad about yourself. You know what I mean? It's just it's yeah. kind of a cascading kind of, kind of things with cards. It just, it folds. And so we have to get... We have to define ourselves by something much more meaningful. Well, let me ask you this question. This is a very common mantra on the left right now that the reason that, you know, inner city schools are failing, the reason that on average the median income of black families is less than white families, Mm -hmm. you know, the reason that there's a higher incarceration rate for black people than white people or Mm -hmm. that there's a higher uh, gang gang membership or, you know, drug use, any number of these social ills, I would call them. Um, The mantra on the left is that this is because of systemic oppression, even if it's not happening now, Mm -hmm. that it is the cascading effect from oppression that did happen. No one's trying to ignore the ills of our past, the racial discrimination that did happen, Mm -hmm. you know, as as near as the 1960s. Mm -hmm. So how would you respond to that? Um, to that mantra or to that narrative that says, well, a lot of the problems might stem from, um, yes, racial discrimination, even white supremacy that black people faced in the past. I would say you have to point out specific evidence to demonstrate where systemic racism still exists. I think racism still exists, but it's not systemic. Jim Crow was systemic. What we're experiencing today, we are living in an America that has a multiplicity of racial preference programs and set-asides to get black people into positions of power and statistical representation that matches their numbers in the general population. It's very hard to argue that systemic racism still exists when all these programs are there to put us in positions of power and influence. So I would simply say racism exists. It's it's always going to exist on this side of heaven, but you cannot let that stop you. Secondly, all of the things that are, are, are manifesting themselves in black communities across the country didn't exist in the early part of the 20th century. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but the early part of the 20th century was much more racist then than she was in the 1960s or even today. So if the problems existed from the 1960s on but didn't exist in the early, early 20th century, why is that? 
Can you make a compelling case that, that systemic racism is, is less now than it was before? If so, I'm all ears. What happens is we've ceded control and, and de self-determination to people who are external mediators on our behalf. We have to take control of our own lives. Bad things happen to good people. It, is, it, is, it has been that way since the beginning of time, but you don't let those bad things define you. What defines you is how you respond to those problems and then overcome them. That's what we've forgotten in our communities, and I fault the black churches and the pastors of these churches by not communicating this type of message to their congregants. It, bad things happen, but, and I don't want to say get over it and flip it because some truly bad things happen, yeah. but bad things happen to American blacks in, during segregation, but yet we still were able to create a lot of worthy things like jazz. If they can create jazz, you know, in a systemically racist country, we can do anything we want if we put our hearts and minds to it. And wouldn't you love to hear, I know you asked me that question rhetorically, but wouldn't you love to hear some of these Democrats or some of these leftists actually answer that question? Yes. I would, yes. I would sincerely, not as a trap, not as a backing them into a corner, I would love to hear what their examples are. I would love to hear the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. They won't have that, they won't have that conversation, nope. which maybe tells you that they don't have an answer to it. They don't have an answer to it. What it is, it's, it's, it's a form of emotional manipulation to get blacks to the polls. So, you know, I'm surprised that they haven't done it in Virginia or in New Jersey, but every time an election comes up, something happens in which they can manipulate blacks because blacks only think about race. Now, see, if we transcended the racial conversation, Democrats wouldn't have anything that would be beneficial to us that would make us go vote for them. We have 65 years of a pattern of failed Democrat and progressive policies in inner cities across the country. Why are American blacks continuing to vote for their own destruction? Be self-empowered and simply say, yes, racism exists, but it's not going to define who I am or my family members. I cannot vote for you because all of your policies have destroyed all of our neighborhoods. I'm not necessarily gonna go vote for conservatives or Republicans. They have to make the effort. I'm just simply not voting for you. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. And this is actually very similar to what I say uh, when young women ask me about sexism mm -hmm. in male-dominated industries. I said, well, of course there's sexism. Mm -hmm. Of course there is, because Absolutely. man is fallen uh -huh. as a religious person. And I'm not talking about man, literally male and female. I'm talking mm -hmm. about mankind as well. Oh, uh, yes. As religious yes. people, we believe mankind has fallen, which means that there is evil, mm -hmm. there is sin. Yes. Sexism and racism and any other ism, ism. Yep. are are sins, and they're always going to be 100%. until until the second coming. They're mm -hmm. going to be, but there's a difference between individual sexism or individual racism, as you said, and institutional sexism mm -hmm. and racism. So if you run into someone, if I run into someone who's individually treats me poorly because I'm a woman, I face individual sexism. Maybe right. you experience the same thing with race. Mm -hmm. That doesn't have to stop us. It might be a, a detour right. or a roadblock, right. but it's not something that we are actively denied of opportunity right. to achieve the American dream based on that. And that's something that, um, whether it is whether it is women's issues or whether it's race issues, it's, it's a difficult thing to say. It's a conversation people aren't willing to have, and it's a message that needs to be out there. Listen, I, I'm sure your experience with sexism is like my experience with discrimination. It's a reflection of a diminishing part of America that no longer exists. People are imperfect. Genesis 3 teaches us that. So we know that people are going to say and do things toward us that are not going to be in our best interest, but we don't let that stop us. We simply say, he's a fallen you know, child of God. We have to treat them the way we want to be treated, even though it might burn us a little bit because of the way, <laughs> but we still have to do that and we just simply overcome. And I just think that we've lost that element uh, in our culture. We've lost that ability to transcend certain things when people offend us. We have to sit there and cry and make a big deal about it. That's not a big deal. That's not a big deal. We have to transcend that. Yeah, and this, this is this is so important. We only have a little bit of time left. Mm -hmm. I could probably sit here and talk to you about this all evening. You but, and me both. <laughs> but I respect you. I do want to ask you. So on Twitter, you responded to Juan Williams, who said that he made a comment that's essentially, this is a paraphrase, of course, that mm -hmm. um, the idea of parental rights, as I think it, as it pertains to education, mm -hmm. um, is just code for white supremacy mm -hmm. or a white race superiority. How do you respond to that? I try to respond respectfully. Yes. Uh, I, I think that Juan is saying that for the specific case in Virginia. However, there are multiple parents, black parents, in multiple urban areas across the country who have advocated for 20 years the ability to send their children to schools of their choice, to have teachers of their choice teach their children because government has been underserving us for multiple generations. I would want to know from Juan Williams what he called the parental rights of black parents in inner cities, white privilege or, or any type of 
racialized uh, 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 denigration as he did with these parents in Virginia? The answer is no. So why is there a double standard? Again, this is the thing that really, really irritates me. There should be a single standard for all Americans. If it's white privilege or whatever the case it is for these parents in Virginia, then what is it for these children, uh, the parents of these children in Chicago, Los Angeles, New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore? Right, because if you look at the polls across the country, um, black parents, and these are black Democrats oftentimes, support the Republican policy of school choice because they mm -hmm. know that that's best for their children's education yep. and best for their families, and there's nothing racist about that. Listen, I think that's how uh, Governor DeSantis got elected it in the state of Florida. Is. It was it black moms is. that said, we want school black choice. Black Democrat moms. Exactly, yes. exactly. Yes. So if it works for Governor DeSantis, there's a lesson there if people want to pick it up and use it. Yes. Until then, we just have to wait and see. This this has been absolutely delightful talking to you. Likewise. Um, will you tell our audience where they can follow you on Twitter or if you have a website where they can connect with you? Sure, they can go to DerekGreen.com. It's spelled D-E-R-R-Y-C-K, green like the color, dot com. Same way on Twitter, same thing on Facebook. Well, great, we will, um, we will link to that. Derek, thank you so much. Thank you. And for all of those of you watching, if you want to see these uh, interviews, interviews like these, if you want exclusive early access, please join us on Locals at LizWheelerShow.com slash Locals for exclusive early access. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Ready, give this video a thumbs up, hit the subscribe button below, and ring the bell to make sure you never miss a video.